Okay, so when we left off, I think we had Hitler and Mussolini. There was a comic that was forcing France to surrender and so on. So we're starting now then with Germany, where things are getting much worse. So of course, the Holocaust is going to begin <clears throat> in earnest. And I mean, the Holocaust, the thing about this is there had been from 1933 to 1939, the goal of Nazi Germany was to get rid of the Jews, to just make it hard for them to live there, make the Jews want to move out of Germany. And then from 1939, with the invasion of Poland, the policy got a little bit more extreme. And this is where we started to hear about, or, or they probably, we think, started to um, maybe circulate a memo talking about the final solution, which was to be the total just annihilation, extermination of Jews throughout the world. And from 1942 to 45, the Nazis are going to be working on genocide. I mean, there's no other way to put it. So this is a very famous picture of the burning of the Warsaw Ghetto. Warsaw Ghetto was one of many ghettos where they would actually, they would wall off certain parts of a city for the Jews. And this was in Warsaw, Poland. And there was actually an insurrection. There was a, a rising up of the Jews in there because the idea was they would put them in these ghettos and not really allow them out. Usually, at least a lot of times, the only person who could really come and go and really talk to the, to the Nazi guards would be the holy man, the rabbi. So anyway, some of them were able to smuggle in some weapons from some people who were, you know, who were non-Jewish and, and wanted to help them. Anyway, that, that whole thing about putting them in ghettos, the next step would be to take them to one of the concentration camps. With the, the uprising at the Warsaw Ghetto, I mean, we saw many of the Jews who were fighting back massacred, and then I can't remember the number that actually ended up getting sent to the camps, you know, anyway. But I know the Germans decided they were going to go almost house to house and see if anyone was hiding anywhere in there. And then finally, they gave the order to just blow it up. So anyway, this picture is, is very famous historical picture. And of course, we have the concentration camps or the work camps as they had been for some time becoming death camps during the final solution, during the, the, the real, you know, part of the, of the Holocaust where they're really amping up the genocide. And remember, concentration camps we talked about back with the Spanish-American War. But in this case, th these are the ones we really think of when we say the words concentration camps. We usually, our minds usually go back to Nazi Germany and the places where they put the people in inhumane conditions and the, the horrors that the Nazis did to people, including doing medical testing on them in all sorts of horrible ways. There was something I saw one time. I don't know if it came from the History Channel. I don't know if it was a, a different, I don't know even if it was a series or what it was. But I know there were at least a few episodes of something called Nazi medicine. And it talks about all the experiments they did on people and um, things like they did experiments with twins. They did experiments that were very painful. They would try to, for example, change someone with brown eyes into someone with blue eyes by injecting blue dye right into their eyes. So horrible things, Dr. Mengele, um, one of the most notorious of the Nazi doctors who did those things. 
But if you hear this, which I do hope you're all listening to it, and you have time and want some extra credit points, if you haven't taken all your extra credit points, and I don't think most of you have, if you could find Nazi Medicine documentary and watch it and just write me a few paragraphs, email it to me, give me some points. Nazis like to document everything. There's tons of pictures. And the picture up in the top left, the guy that's kind of back behind the, the I don't know, what is that, like a, a board? There's, I guess they're supposed to be in a kind of a bunk-ish type bed. But anyway, the guy in the back on the, in, in the top left picture, the one on the far right in that picture, I believe is Elie Wiesel, who wrote the book Night, and talked about his experiences when he was young in two of these horrible camps. And so he just happens to be in this picture. And if you, you know, if you look him up, his most famous book, I think, was called Night. And it's not been that long since he passed away. But that generation, people that are old enough to actually remember the Holocaust or people who were, were fighting in that war, World War II, you know, that generation's almost gone. So I always ask people in my history classes, you know, I'm like, look, if you have people of the older generations who are still around, talk to them, write down things they say, record them, do something to not lose the memories of a generation because people tend to forget things and people tend to try to twist history and and people who were there, once they disappear, that makes it harder to get the truth out about what happened in any situation. So, you know, again, if you have grandparents, you have, you know, people who are older, you talk to them, somehow document some things, because I can't imagine that you won't value that at some point in your life. And it might even be valuable in a bigger sense, just like you know, many things that we find in history that we use as primary sources. But anyway, Nazis are documenting everything and you can see the way the camps looked. And more faces from the camps. I had a professor several years ago named Dr. Allen and she used to show us a video called Night and Fog. I haven't been able to find many times that video on YouTube in English or with an English, you know, dubbing or subtitle because it's in French, but it's only about 29 minutes. And I remember she told us, she showed us the video. I mean, she, she was older, she had a VHS tape and, you know, showed us the video one night in class. And afterwards she said, you know, she, she always has to take a break every time she shows that video for years and years because it's so horrible. And I kind of understand finally over the years what Dr. Allen meant because every time I talk about the Holocaust and I look at the same pictures or I, I, I you know think about the same stories that I've read or whatever, and I had classes about Hitler and Nazi Germany and stuff, but when I go and I, I talk about this stuff, just pretty much every time on some level I get emotional because if you look at the pictures, those are real people and they had real families, they had real lives and just the, the whole horror of what happened in Germany to so many people and Poland and the other places that, that the Germans are, are occupying and reaching out and it always does leave me emotional as well. So if you, if you have a chance, that's another one. If you can find Night and Fog, it's, it was made in 1955 by the French. I remember that because they went back 10 years after the Holocaust was over, after World War II was over. And the French went back, went, went over to Germany and they went, I believe, to Dachau for one place. And they, they showed just some, some terrible things. And you guys are, desensitized a lot because of movies and media. My generation, we were the first ones to really be desensitized. So I totally understand. But 
one thing about history that I do love and I do connect with is the fact that everything we talk about, it involves people just like us in, in one way or the other. They're just people like us. So Night and Fog, if you get a chance to watch that, and if you find it on YouTube with English um, either subtitle or dubbing, let me know. And you can get extra credit on that too if you, if you watch it and write something about it. All righty. So we'll move on from this one. Well, I mean, the Germans are attempting to take over as much territory as they can. And during this war, we've got the phases where we had the Axis powers were in control up until, you know, really 1941, December, when the Axis powers are going to make a big mistake. So we're going to figure out exactly what's going on in Germany once the Allies take control. And the United States is going to enter on the side of the Allies, again, December 1941, under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I remember reading a few years ago that there were some dates that Americans really should know. You should, you should know some of these dates, whether you like history or not. There are some dates that are so important that you should just know. We should have taught you these dates from, you know, when you were chi children, little kids. You, you should know these dates. And one of the dates they say that people are starting to forget is December 7th, 1941. You need to know that day. This is what got the United States into World War II. This is where we start to see once the United States joins, we do help them turn around some, some things that were going on over there. We're gonna bring our forces in and we're entering the war just like we did in World War I. We're entering it later, but Unlike World War I, I mean, we have an attack directly on a base where we have the largest concentration of U.S. forces in the Pacific, okay? So we have an, a direct attack on a military base, basically, on December 7th, 1941 by the Japanese who bomb Pearl Harbor and, and the next day, okay, United States enters the war the next day. Franklin Delano Roosevelt asks for a declaration of war, and he gives his speech a day which will live in infamy, which basically means that this was so awful, so infamous, you know, famous for being awful, that we would never forget it, which again is sad because this, you know, article that I read said that a lot of people really don't know that date and don't remember the significance of that date. So I want you guys to not be those people. I want you to know December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day and why it's important. This one's a little bit repetitious, but I don't think that repeating anything's ever hurt. So, December 7th, 1941, a day which will live in infamy. Japanese attack, Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. December 8th, 1941, the United States declares war on Japan. That is the last, actually, time that we have declared war through the constitutional way, which means going through the Congress. Okay, it's the last time. And then December 11th, 1941, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. I notice there's Italy, Italy declaring war on the United States. So if you look on the right, you're going to see a portrayal of a kamikaze. Kamikaze meant divine wind. And these were the pretty much the suicide bombers because the Japanese, at some point, they, they realized that they couldn't bomb wherever they needed to bomb and then get back to, you know, to their own base. And so they started sending a lot of these guys in 
to bomb places. And as they were bombing the place, you know, whatever the target was, they would just crash the plane into it because they knew they couldn't make it back to where they came from. So anyway, you can see up there on the, on the plane what the representation of that is. Famous picture of the Japanese planes preparing to take off to attack Pearl Harbor that morning. I've got a book out in my office at, you know, at work. It's called At Dawn We Slept, and it's the story of, you know, soldiers at Pearl Harbor. And, um, you know, it happened at dawn, and, and they weren't prepared. And anyway, that's, um, you know, this picture has become widely, widely circulated because of what happened after those planes took off. We don't like to think of the racist elements in our culture. We don't like to think of it today. We didn't, you know, we, we don't like to talk about some of the things that have happened, but you have to have the good and the bad, and you can't put on blinders and say there's only good or there's only bad. Okay, so we're going to talk about the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, there was, in World War II, more tolerance for German people. Remember, World War I, it was just, we're not even going to, we're not even going to teach German in schools anymore. We're going to burn your books or ban your German books, or we're going to call hot, hot dogs and hamburgers weird things. Well, actually, Frankfurters, and that one, that one actually stuck. But, um, you know, as far as hot dog goes, but they were going to say like Liberty sausage and, and the poor dachshund, you know, he had to be a Liberty pup, all that weird stuff in World War I. Well, we don't do that in World War II. Okay, remember, this is the good war. We're fighting the bad guys, particularly the Nazis. But in this case, we were really angry at their government, not at the German people. The same goes for the Italian fascist government. Okay, we we're not doing a lot of propaganda against the people of Italy or Germany. But Japanese Americans, that was an exception. Why? Well, you know why. Okay, because people when they when they lash out, if there's anything different about someone, they're going to find that difference and and they're going to make that other person into the other and bring up any anything that would stand out, like in this case, racial, cultural characteristics, because a lot of things are different about the Japanese people than the American people today, then, okay? But what we saw was we saw a lot of propaganda that really went right for the Japanese people, not just the government. Here's a, just a few examples of some racist, stereotypical, anti-Japanese propaganda. And you could, I'm sure you could find many more. But if you look at the top left, you notice a style of drawing that looks familiar. You also notice that it's got a name. Oh, wait, look at that, Dr. Seuss. Now, you can look that up if you want to, but Dr. Seuss actually drew a lot of, of actually racist propaganda stuff during World War II. And you can, again, I'll leave it to you to read these, but these are just some of the tame ones that you can find out there showing exactly what they wanted us to do, which was to take the hatred to the people, not just to the higher up. Racist-driven animosity is also going to touch Americans, American citizens of Japanese descent. We had about 120,000 Japanese Americans in the United States, mainly in California. Okay? And think about it, if you're coming from Europe, if you were an immigrant, you were coming to Ellis Island, New York. 
Remember, if you're coming from the Orient, you're coming from Japan, you're coming from China, you're coming from anywhere in the Far East, you're going to come to California. So you have still to this day, large population of Asian Americans in especially Northern California, but California in general. But back then, 120,000, that's all. And there's two different groups, and I, I never, I'm sure I never pronounced these right, but the Issei were one third of the Japanese Americans in the United States. They were unnaturalized first generation. And then the Nisei, this was the other, this was the two thirds, and they were naturalized. They had become citizens or they were born on the U.S. soil, so they were native born citizens. When it comes to the American people, and it comes down to you and me, a lot of people were more tolerant of the Japanese Americans than of Japanese people, but the United States government took action. And in February of 1942, we see something that I certainly hope we never see again under any circumstances, but the War Relocation Authority. Now, this was to oversee the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, remember, it's sort of concentration camps. You're, you're taking people from their homes against their will. You're locking them away somewhere, and they can't come and go as they please. So, again, you know, it's not brutal, but it's not comfortable. The goal is to Americanize the Japanese, and particularly the children. They're going to try really you know, hard to make sure that they are going to become loyal Americans. Now, I have put a link on the PowerPoint to a piece of American propaganda called, let me see, what is the name of that? It's called Japanese Relocation. Okay, it's 1942, American internment camp, World War II propaganda. What it is, okay? So I've got that. I hope it works on there. If it doesn't, send me an email and I'll I'll make sure that I send a link that everybody can access. But anyway, I've got it right on the on the PowerPoint itself. Things were gonna improve by 1943. You're going to have a lot of the, the younger ones who had grown up, you know, growing up right on that edge of being old enough to go to college. They, they let several of them out. And then we have a big court case it goes to the Supreme Court, Korematsu versus the United States. Now, this is 1944, and it said that relocation is constitutionally permissible. The government can relocate you, which is pretty Terrifying, actually, especially since so many of the people they relocated were indeed American citizens of Japanese descent. So later that year, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, we better make it a little bit more, you know, clear. We're not going to in turn, we're not going to lock away loyal citizens. Now, I might ask you if we were in person, I would look at you and I'd say, hey, Mark, are you a loyal citizen? I'd say, hey, you know, who, are you a loyal citizen? I don't know, but if I want to interpret it for myself as, let's say, the government or a judge or somebody else, it, they might not get that right, and they might decide to go ahead and lock you away for whatever reasons. So Korematsu versus the United States, you need to check that out sometime. Read that, um, read that Supreme Court decision when you get a chance. And by 1945, the Japanese were out of their homes, or out of the camps, rather, and out of their homes, but out of the camps. And when they, when they went back to their homes and their businesses, other people had claimed them. Okay, They're not just going to go back home and be able to start their lives over. Okay, Most of their homes are just now gone, and they have nothing, really. A few minutes and watch this video. I think it's about nine minutes long. Okay. 
World War II, you need to know the main combatants, okay? The Axis, that's Germany, Italy, Japan. Don't worry about the others. Then in October 43, Italy does it again, goes over to the Allies, blah, blah, blah. Okay, poor, um, poor whoever's allied with Italy because Italy is not going to be the most um, reliable alliance that you could have. And then we have the Allies. So we have the United States, Great Britain, France, which was down for the count early on, uh, USSR or the Soviet Union, and then a bunch of other uh, less you know, not the, the major players in this, okay? So Germany, Italy, Japan, United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. So we got word from no less a man than Albert Einstein himself that the Germans were working on a nuclear bomb so the United States government puts a ton of money into something that is codenamed the Manhattan Project in 1941. This is going to be the attempt to create an atomic bomb. So it's going to be at several different places. The guy you need to know is J. Robert Oppenheimer. He was one of the guys who really was vital to this operation. He was a theoretical physicist. And he's going to be in charge of a lot of the scientific parts of the Manhattan Project from Los Alamos, New Mexico, starting in, you know, 1942. And the production of fissionable plutonium, the fuel for the atomic explosion, you know, and all of this put together, a lot of the men working on this project didn't really know the full extent of what they were working on. They only knew their little piece of the puzzle. Things are turning around for the Allies. The United States wins a victory in the Battle of Midway against Japan in 1942. August, we have our first U.S. Marines, first offensive at Guadalcanal. Famous picture over there of the, of the Marines landing at Guadalcanal. As we're getting closer to the end of the war, well, we see interesting bedfellows again. Got 1943 Tehran Conference. We've got on the left, Joseph Stalin, oh, the premier of the USSR. Sitting there beside the American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the British prime minister, Winston Churchill. This is just an aberration for the United States to be working with Stalin. But that's, that's the way it was. So they met in uh, 1943, and they decided that since Germany had been the belligerent in both world wars, that Germany was going to need to be occupied by the Allies after World War II ended. So keep that in mind, because that's going to be important when we talk about the early Cold War. Famous date as things are changing for the Allies. You have June 6, 1944, D-Day. This is where we have the invasion of the French coast of Normandy. And what we've got here really is where we've got the beginning of the end of the Nazis on the continent of Europe. And the last time the Nazis are going to have an offensive is going to be the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle of the Arden Forest in Belgium. And at that point, they lost and they are now in retreat. Again, the war is winding down. 1945 comes. April. Hitler is running out of options. He commits suicide. Germany surrendered unconditionally May 8th. August 6th, we dropped the first atomic bomb ever. It was codenamed Little Boy. The plane was the Enola Gay. And we dropped this bomb 
on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Okay, it's devastating, and I've got some pictures in a minute to show you. And we warn, okay, by, by 1945, well, by 1945, um, FDR has passed away, and we have Harry Truman as president, and he's had to make this decision to drop the atomic bombs. And it was horrible in Hiroshima, and so we warn the Japanese that we're going to do it again if they don't surrender. And Harry Truman said in some of his writings that for, for the rest of his life, he had to live with this, and he believed that if he had not dropped the atomic bombs, that the Japanese were not going to surrender, and we could have gone on for so much longer and had many, many more, maybe millions of people die. And the, the whole Japanese, the whole, the whole thing about surrender and, and you know, they're, they're not, they would rather just do just about anything other than surrender. The Japanese are sending in those kamikazes, remember the suicide bombers by this time in, in bigger numbers. And I mean, the suicide bombers are dying and killing people almost faster than they can train new pilots. So it's, you know, the Japanese are in trouble. So we warned them, we're like, look, you know, this is gonna happen again. But August 9th, the second atomic bomb, codenamed Fat Man, is gonna be dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Now remember, we are hitting civilians here. We are killing so many civilians. In Hiroshima, about 70,000 people were instantly vaporized, just gone. Okay, and there's, there's horrible, horrible stories. And I've seen many, many pictures of these type of things where someone would be, would be standing there when the atomic bomb went off and you see the mushroom cloud and then someone was just gone, but you could see their shadow had been burned into the wall behind them. So it's, just, it's incredible. Japan surrenders then and the war's over but we've got a lot more to deal with after the war. The next few slides are mostly pictures and don't require much commentary. So I'm just gonna kind of say a couple of words with each one. So here's some pictures from Hiroshima. More devastation. Still more human beings just like us. A few scenes from the second atomic bomb's devastation at Nagasaki. again. But when the Allies get into Germany, they were not prepared at all for what they were going to see. As the Allied soldiers liberate some of the terrible camps, they're going to be greeted as, of course, the heroes they are. See him raising the American flag in the background. Picture from liberation of one of the most notorious of the camps, Auschwitz. So this one is really personal to me because my dad was an ambulance driver medic in World War II. And you know, one of the things that he actually talked about, he hardly would ever say anything about the war. But I learned from, you know, doing some research and from little pieces of things he had said over the years that um, he was actually, of course, he, he had mentioned if you pushed him, that he had been at Dachau, at the liberation of Dachau. And as a medic, 
you know, I, I was thinking about that and again did some research. But here's American soldiers at the gates as it's liberating, as it's being liberated. And the inmates were given medical attention immediately. And so my dad would have been right there involved in all that. Now, outside of Dachau, there were 40 train boxcars with about 2,000 dead. And I love the way General Eisenhower, General, eventually President Dwight David Eisenhower said that there were, it was something like, I'm, try, I'm trying to paraphrase him. He said something about how all of those Nazi guards were immediately neutralized by the Allied soldiers. So yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a, a very um, sad day as they go in there and they see the condition of so many of the people. But still, I mean, this is a great victory to be able to free these people from the Nazis and all the horrors they've been through. And I always imagine my dad maybe dealing with these guys or guys just like this, okay, too weak to eat solid food. I mean, they, they're, they're just the pictures speak for themselves so much in, in the next slides, definitely still. Documentation. As they come in, they're shocked at how many bodies they're going to find. And more of the survivors in the hospital barracks. And just look at their legs. It's, it's hard. Definitely don't have words for that. Never do. So the way I end this, because we're going to be talking in the next, um, you know, next slideshow about the early Cold War. And the way I end this is just basically with Yalta and Potsdam, because Yalta Conference had happened in February of 1945 where we had FDR was still alive, Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin drew up the plan for a post-war Europe, remember occupation, they talked about that at Tehran also. Germany is gonna be partitioned into four zones of occupation by the allies. And when we talk about the early Cold War, you're gonna see how that works or doesn't work very well. Potsdam in July of 1945, we have Churchill, Stalin and Harry Truman, again, FDR, and Hitler both died in April. Hitler committed suicide, um, but they both died the same month. Now, the Allies are starting to disagree with the Soviet Union, Communist Russia, because Soviet Union is not going to allow free elections. And there's a lot of other stuff brewing under the surface, but the Cold War is about to begin. And that's the next slideshow, the very last one that you're going to need for your last exam will be over the early Cold War.